Welcome to CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Marshall. A man too careful of danger liveth in continual torment, goes an old proverb. But where do we draw the line between courage and rashness? In normal situations, we can rely on our common sense to guide us. But what do we rely on in situations which involve forces we know nothing about? Sir, look, something's come between us and the door. It looks like an enormous shroud with luminous green eyes. It, it's coming toward us. Stand firm, Chivas. It's only an illusion. But if, if it's only an illusion, why can I feel its force? The supernatural does not exist, Chivas. It does not. Our mystery drama... The House and the Brain is based on a short story by the English writer Edward Bulwer Lytton. It was adapted especially for Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Gordon Heath. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Haunting of the Living by the Spirits of the Departed has long been a popular theme among writers on the supernatural. Edward Bulwer Lytton a 19th century English politician, added a most interesting tale to the genre. What makes his tale so absorbing, aside from his obsession with good and evil, a favorite theme with the Victorians of his day, is the theory he advances to explain the haunting of the particular house he deals with. And what makes his theory so absorbing is its plausibility. We're in the heart of 19th century London, in a fashionable residential area. Yes? Uh, there's a Mr. Blake to see you, sir. Blake? Oh, yes, Samuel Blake. Uh, show him in, Chivas. Very good, sir. Mr. Blake? Oh, thank you. Uh, Harold, I, I hope I'm not disturbing you. No, no, not at all. I was just relaxing from my morning lecture. What's wrong with you? You're white as a sheet. What on earth is the matter? Well... Since I last saw you at the club, something very extraordinary has happened. You're going to think me quite ridiculous. Uh, as you know, my wife and I were in search of a furnished flat. Yes, I remember. Did you find one? Well, we thought we had. A large, comfortable-looking house on a quiet side street near Leicester Square. We let the rooms by the week and left after the third day. No power on earth could induce us to return. What happened? Well, I, 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 I know your opinions on such matters, Harold, and I'm quite prepared to have you mock me, but the fact is, the house was haunted. Uh, but not in the usual sense. That is, we didn't see any ghosts and we didn't hear any noises. Well, then? What drove us away was an undefinable terror which seized us whenever we passed by the door to a certain unfurnished room. Terror? But it was more than just a feeling. It was as if a force were emanating from the room, even when the door was closed. Had you any advanced knowledge that the house might be haunted? You mean, were we subject to the power of suggestion? No. We had no prior inkling whatsoever. Still, it's possible it was simply your own fancy. No. For when we summoned the housekeeper, an elderly lady, she gave us the strangest smile and said... You've stayed longer than any other lodger. They've been very kind to you. So she knew, and yet she lived there. She said she remembered the spirits from years ago, and she'd lived there not as a servant. And then she said something very odd. I know they will be the death of me someday, but I don't care. 
I'm old and must die soon anyhow. And then I shall be with them and in this house still. If you give me the housekeeper's name and the address, there's nothing I should like better than to spend a night there. Yes? Uh, my name is Harold Rumsford. I'm looking for a Mrs. Cavendish. She's not here. This is 47 Hatch Lane, isn't it? I said she's not here. I was told by a former lodger, a Mr. Samuel Blake, that she was the housekeeper of this establishment. Mrs. Cavendish is dead. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, then who are you? My name is Walter Garrison, sir. I'm the unfortunate owner of this property. May I inquire what were the circumstances of Mrs. Cavendish's death? What business is that of yours? I've heard this house is considered to be haunted. Yes, it is. I can't rent it. Can't even find a servant to keep it. I'm a scientist by profession, Mr. Garrison. But I've made a lifelong study of supernatural phenomena. And I'd be most obliged if I could hire your house for a night to examine it. Oh? Uh, well, forgive me, Mr... Uh, uh, Rumsford. Oh, yeah, Mr. Rumsford. I came here today to close it up for good. But if you think you might come up with an explanation for the hobgoblins that live here, I'd gladly put the house at your disposal. And rent, of course, is out of the question. Oh. If you'll give me the keys, I'll send my manservant round to select and prepare our rooms for the evening. You're obviously not impressed. Oh, I am indeed. But it is my belief, Mr. Garrison, that there is no such thing as the supernatural. Then how would you explain the forces which undoubtedly inhabit this house? These forces killed Mrs. Cavendish. She was found on her bed, her eyes wide open, and a look of terror frozen on her face. According to my friend, Mr. Blake, she apparently knew something about these forces. Well, she seemed less frightened of them than most, yes. I should like to have talked to her. What can you tell me of her past? Nothing. Nothing more than she was once mistress of the house. But I can make inquiries if you think it might be helpful. It would indeed. For I'm convinced that with sufficient information, we could come up with a very rational explanation. Uh, good evening, sir. Welcome to the haunted house. Hello, Chivers. Ah, you brought Duke with you. Uh. He enjoys prowling about these old houses so much, I could hardly leave him at home. Right. Uh, well, if you come upstairs, I've got a room all ready for you. Uh, have you seen or heard anything yet? Oh, a couple of queer things, I suppose. What? Well, the, the sound of feet pattering behind me. Uh, and once or twice whispers in my ear. Uh, nothing more. And you weren't at all frightened? Oh, no, not in the least, sir. Uh, uh, this is your room, sir. I've got a nice fire going to keep the night chill away. Uh, and where's your room? I chose the adjoining chamber, right through that door there. Good. Now, let's begin by having a look at the room which gave old Blake and his missus such a fright. <laughs> yes, sir. Just follow me. It's at the end of the hallway here. I've been down there once already. How did it seem? Uh, quite harmless. You didn't feel anything? No, sir. Just a simple, vacant room. Here we are. Oh, that's odd. Well, what's the matter? Well, I'm certain I left it unlocked. Well, I shall have to go back for the key. Did you... Did you see that? The door opened by itself. Well, obviously, we are being invited in to have a look round. Hold up the candle, Chivas. Yes. Well, the room's quite bare. Where could the person who's playing these tricks hide. Mm, the walls seem quite solid. No hidden doors. Sir, the door closed. It's locked. We are trapped. I must say I'm beginning to imagine how Blake must have felt. Look. It opened again. Quickly, get out to the landing. I got a very distinct impression in that room, Chivas. Sir, 
A sensation as if we were in the presence of a powerful force of evil. Sir, there's something else. What? In this room up here on the next landing. Quiet, you. What room is this we're going to? It was the housekeeper's. The room where she was found dead. In the drawer by her bed, I found two letters. I see they are both addressed to Mrs. Cavendish. Postmark date is 35 years old. Would that have been when she was mistress of the house? Probably, yes. Hmm. Now, here's something both letters make reference to. Something that sounds very much like a crime. Listen. Don't let anyone be in the same room with you at night. You talk in your sleep. And in this one, even more interesting, what's done can't be undone. And I tell you, there's nothing against us unless the dead should come to life. And next to this, in the margin, written in a female hand, are the words, they do. Hey, what, what, what was that? I don't... What, sir, uh, look, in front of you, I, a hand... It's grasping the letters. Uh, the hand's disappeared, taking the letters with it. Are you all right? Well, something struck my arm. It's numb. Sir, there, there's another presence in this room. I can feel it. Hold steady, Jesus. Look, the, the, the flame in my candle, it's beginning to flicker, even though there's no draft. It's growing small. What's the matter with Duke? He must see something. He's cowering in terror. <coughs> what happened? Oh, Duke. He's been flung against the wall, sir. He's, he's dead. Dead? Are you sure? Yes. His neck is broken. What force could have caused it? I don't know. But we'd better get back to our rooms. Look, look, there's something coming between us and the door. I think that's your answer, Cheevers. An, an enormous shadow. Meant to terrify us. Do not give in. But, but its eyes, sir. Look at its eyes. They're green, shining like a serpent's. It's just a trick. A trick? It took the letters, didn't it? It struck your arm, it Jim Duke. Look, it's coming toward us. Stand fast. I can't. This thing means to kill us. We must get out of this house as quickly as possible. Are you coming, sir? No. I'm going to stay until I find out what this thing is. Mr. Garrison, owner of the house at 47 Hatch Lane. I am. What may I do for you? My name is Cheever, sir. I'm manservant to Mr. Harold Rumsford. Or perhaps I should say the late Mr. Rumsford. What? What's happened? We, we must call the police at once. Your house contains a force of such power, I saw it break the neck of my master's dog with my own eyes. Broke its neck? That's when I fled. And Mr. Rumsford? He was determined to stay and confront this force, this apparition that arose before us. It was horrible, sir. It had empty, snake-like eyes that glowed in the dark, the most terrible shade of green. And it was as tall as the ceiling. And Mr. Rumsford has not been home this morning? No, sir. We must go right away. Hey, excuse me. I'm sure we'll find him horribly mangled. And... Mr. Rumsford. Good morning, Garrison. Chivers. Sir, are you all right? I think so. It got considerably worse after you left. What happened? Oh, I can describe what I saw, Mr. Garrison, but I'm not at all sure I can explain it. Of one thing, however, I am absolutely convinced. This force that haunts your house is a powerful and evil will that somehow has its origin in a living human mind. so little understanding of the full power of the mind. 
Are you aware, for example, that most of us use no more than 15% of our brain's total power? And that even a genius like Einstein used only 17%? What fantastic things might be achieved by a person who had the discipline to unleash the mind's complete force? And how terrifying if this person's mind preferred evil to good. I shall return shortly with Act Two. If a man harbors any sort of fear, it percolates through all his thinking, damages his personality, and makes him landlord to a ghost. So spoke Lloyd Douglas. Fear can make us cowards, but it is also a survival instinct bred into all species. Lack of fear can lead us down dangerous paths. Harold Rumsford has demonstrated a remarkable presence of mind, but is this to be envied? For where might it lead him? You think some person is behind the troubles in my house? Why, Mr. Rumsford? Because, Mr. Garrison, Things do not simply appear out of thin air. Chivas. Yes, sir. I must talk with Mr. Garrison. Will you wait for me at home? Yes, sir. I, I, I want to apologize for breaking ranks last night. That will be all, Chivas. Yes, sir. Good day, Mr. Garrison. Good day. Uh, let me begin by describing what happened. Your manservant told me about the shadow. With the curious snake-like eyes, yes. Next, I was attacked, literally attacked, by a horde of images. I could feel them physically striking me. Now, uh, what kind of images? I couldn't tell. They seemed only half-formed and came and went with lightning speed. But the strangest thing was, I felt the threat was not to my body, but to my mind. As if someone were trying to subjugate me by terror. And I knew if I gave in, my fear would kill me just as it killed my dog. Oh, yes, I heard about that. I'm sorry. Quite abruptly, this random assault of images gave way to two brief scenes. In the first, I saw the apparitions of a young man and woman dressed in fashions popular a hundred years ago. They approached each other like two lovers. But just as they touched, the shadow swooped down and covered them. And when he drew back, they lay as if dead upon the floor. And the second scene? It was the phantom of an old woman, and possibly Mrs. Cavendish. Why do you think that? Because she was reading two letters I'd found in her room that hinted of some crime. They'd been snatched from my grasp. As she read them... Her face was transformed into a young woman's. Then behind her there appeared the bloated face of a man. Bloated? As if he might have been drowned. The woman turned and reached out for him as if she was begging forgiveness. But just then the shadow swooped down again. And when it withdrew, the figures had vanished. Well, that, that's a remarkable coincidence. What is? You remember asking me to make inquiries about Mrs. Cavendish? Well, she was married to a rather strange man with an unsavory reputation, supposedly an American. They bought that house. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Cavendish's older brother was found drowned, like the man in your second apparition. The crime referred to in the letters. Possibly. Foul play was suspected. Though it couldn't be proven Mrs. Cavendish came into a good deal of money as a result of her brother's death. What happened then? The American husband took the money and vanished. Disappeared. The house fell to my uncle in lieu of payment of a loan. And from charity, he kept Mrs. Cavendish on as housekeeper. We may be onto something here. The mind, Mr. Garrison, is a powerful and mysterious organ. We have no idea what might be the ultimate range of its power. For example... It's been discovered recently that the basis for the brain's thought waves is electrochemical. Think of the implications. A brain, theoretically, could transmit thoughts over incredible distances. Thoughts powerful enough to kill old Mrs. Cavendish? Well, even if you're correct, 
Why should a person want to do this? Why does an evil person want to do anything? I don't know, Garrison. But I am certain that what I saw and felt in that house last night were the half-formed and ever-shifting thoughts of a human brain. But could this brain or this person have known details of Mrs. Cavendish's brother's murder? Presumably, the only two who knew about it were Mrs. Cavendish and her husband. Whatever became of Mr. Cavendish? No, no one knows. After his disappearance of the brother's money... He was never seen or heard from again. Well, I cannot answer your doubts. My theory is obviously incomplete. And there's nothing that can be done to save my house? No. I think that wherever the haunting force comes from, its receptacle within the house is the small, unfurnished room on the second floor. I notice that room is an addition and not part of the main body of the building. It could be removed. And you believe that if I did that... You would cut the telegraph wires from the source, so to speak, and be left with as pleasant a house as any in London. Cheevers and I will assist you. I think the house simply ought to be locked up permanently. What is there to lose? It will give me the chance to test my theory and possibly restore the value to your property. Uh, very well. A small enough expense, I suppose. We'll engage some workmen in the morning. Well, we've had a smooth enough time of it so far. I suppose. Uh, sir. What is it, Chivas? Uh, we, we've discovered something very interesting. Uh, there appears to be an entire room beneath this one. Did you know anything about this, Garrison? No. Uh, come look down where the floorboards have been taken up, sir. What? Oh, so there is. It appears to be furnished. How odd. I never suspected its existence. Chivas, have the man remove more of these boards. This room has obviously been sealed off for some time. The furniture's a hundred years old. Uh, sir. Yes, Chivas. Look at this. Lodged in the chimney brick. What? Yeah. Ah, oh, it's a wall safe. Oh, the lock is quite securely fastened. Do I have your permission to force it? Mr. Garrison? Well, yes, by all means. What do you find in there, Ralph, sir? Several small bottles filled with liquid, a small iron rod, and three rocks. Rocks? Yes. Crystal, amber, and lodestone. Well, there's hardly such valuable rocks as to warrant their being locked in a safe. I don't believe they were locked up for their value, Garrison. Think for a moment. What do crystal, amber, and lodestone have in common? Well, I... I don't know. They all possess electrical properties. They are excellent conductors of current, as is the liquid in these vials. Well, that supports your theory that the forces might be telepathically transmitted. What else is in here? I will look here. Wrapped in a sheet of paper. A man's portrait in miniature. Uh, he has a most striking countenance. In Frumsford. I know this man. You do? How? Where? In India. He was a Frenchman. By the name of De Roca. A more ruthless man I've never known. Just to look at him made me shiver. He attempted to foment a rebellion against the Rajah of Pradesh. And was banished. And what became of Daroka? Well, I don't know. How long ago was this? Well, I was in the foreign service. Perhaps 20 years. But the date of the portrait is 1765. That would be 100 years ago. I could swear it was the same man. I could never forget that face. It's most odd, Garrison, because I was about to say that I too have seen this face before. Where? In another painting. A portrait much larger than this one in the house of a collector recently. It was the portrait of a nobleman, a Lord Shillingford, who lived some 200 years ago. He was a dissipated wretch who died trying to escape the law. Except for the fact that the fellow in this picture is perhaps a half dozen years older than Shillingford, I could swear the same person sat for both paintings. And my only qualm with this portrait's resemblance to De Roca... Yet this fellow is perhaps a half dozen years younger. 
Yet the time span is nearly two centuries. It's a remarkable coincidence, I say. What's that? Chivas, what are the workmen doing? No, no, nothing, sir. The, the whole room is trembling by itself. Quickly, break those vials and throw those rocks from the face over the wall. Uh, Rumsfeld, I, I, I wonder if we oughtn't to leave off this enterprise. We should be all right now. The eyes of this man in this miniature painting, they're almost hypnotic. And their shape, like a serpent's. Like... The shining, hollow, green eyes of the shadow that menaced you last night? Yes. I wonder who this person is. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a clasp on the back. Ah, there's an inscription. Mariana, to thee, be faithful in life and death to Jack Tarbuck. I, I know that name. Tarbuck was a scoundrel who made a sensation in London a century ago and was forced to flee the country on the charge of murdering his mistress and his rival within the walls of his own house. That could be the first of the two scenes I witnessed last night, the death of the two young lovers. Yes, it certainly could. Because the house Jack Tarbuck lived in was this one. You're sore. Yeah, I remember my uncle telling me. Hey, hey, look, there's something written on the paper the miniature was wrapped in. It's in Latin. On all that it can reach within these walls, living or dead, works my will. Accursed be this house and restless the dwellers therein. <laughs> so, all these years, this house has been haunted by the ghost of a jealous, jilted lover. <laughs> Have you got a match? Oh, yes, I believe so. Burn this paper. There goes the anathema. Up in smoke. Well, Garrison, let us hope your house will now be safe to live in once again. If Harold Rumsford is correct, then by destroying the crude transmitter in the safe, the house should be free from the forces which cause so much terror and destruction. Some very interesting questions have been raised which have yet to be answered. I shall return shortly with our final act. If you were to pick up a hammer and bash in your radio at this very moment, you could rid yourselves of the sound of my voice. But you would not, of course, destroy it. Or me either, for that matter. This grim thought is simply by way of illustrating the point we have reached in our story. Mr. Garrison's house may now be free of the evil influences that haunted it, but has the evil itself been destroyed? Can it be destroyed? Where does it come from? And what power does it still have? Garrison, your valet told me I'd find you up here. Oh, uh, Rumsford, I was just admiring the view of the square from the second floor parlor here. I noticed the moving van down there in the street. You've decided to occupy this house yourself? Oh, why not? In the three weeks since we destroyed those rooms, there hasn't been so much as a creaky floorboard in the whole place. Tarbuck's ghost seems to have departed once and for all. You still think it was just a ghost? Don't tell me you still maintain it was some sort of emanation from a living brain. I do. But even if mesmerism, or whatever you choose to call it, could work in the absence of the operator and produce these extraordinary effects, is it possible those effects could continue when the operator himself was dead? But if he were not dead? Not dead? Well, that's hardly likely. That room was walled up a hundred years ago. Tarbuck was middle-aged then. If he were alive today... He'd have to be 150. I wonder what Mrs. Cavendish's American husband looked like. No, oh, you're out of luck there. I gather he wasn't the kind to have his portrait painted. Well, why? You think he too might have had the same serpentine eyes and hypnotic countenance as the others? No, I tell you, those resemblances are merely coincidental. Good Lord. Huh? What's the matter? Look, down there in the street, that person talking to the moving men... His face, it's the face in the miniature. Yes. 
the face of Daruka. Scarcely a day older than when I knew him in the Rajah's court 20 years ago. Rumsford, where are you going? I must confront that man before he escapes. Yeah, be careful. Uh, Rumsford, are you all right? Did you catch up to him? Yes. But as I drew alongside him, he glanced at me with such a gaze, I lost my voice. You said nothing? What was I to say? That he resembled a dissolute nobleman of two centuries past? And a murdering charlatan? Oh, you're Mr. Daroka. It would have been an outrageous impertinence. Well, perhaps we can still catch him. No. I saw him get into a carriage and drive off. I've missed my chance. Did you ask your movers what he said to them? Yes. He wanted to know who was now living in this house. Harold. Hmm? Oh, hello, Samuel. I haven't seen you at the club here for weeks. Not since I came to your house that morning with my tale of terror. <laughs> Did you go through with your plan to spend the night there? Yes, I did, actually. Ah, wasn't I right? Wasn't there a supernatural force? There was a force there. Blake, that man. What? The gentleman who just entered on the far side of the lounge. It's he again. A pardon? Oh, oh, yes. Fancy, I didn't know he was in town. Do you know him? Yes, matter of fact, I do. He's a most remarkable person. I met him last year in Damascus. What can you tell me about him? Among other things, he's the best oriental scholar I know. What nationality is he? British. He's lived out of the country for many years, though. He's only recently arrived here. Uh, just between you and me, I suspect he's a renegade of some sort. What makes you think that? Because he's immensely rich. But I have no idea how he came to be so. No, so far as I can tell, does anybody else. And, uh, by the way, he's a great mesmerizer. A mesmerizer? Oh, yes, yes. I I've seen him with my own eyes produce effects on inanimate objects. Will you introduce me to him? I have some questions I should very much like to put to him. Yes, of course. What's his name? Oh, uh, rather plain one. Richard. And his birth? His family? I have no idea. His past is really quite a mystery. Uh, come, if you want an introduction. Uh, Mr. Richards? Yes? Ah, oh, Mr. Samuel Blake, I believe. Uh, yes, we... Met in Damascus on April 3rd of last year. <laughs> yes. I, I, I should like to introduce you to a friend of mine, Professor Harold Rumsford. He's a scientist with a particular interest in natural forces. How do you do? I'm most interested to meet you, sir. I'm sure you two have much in common, and you must now excuse me. I see the gentleman I've been waiting for has arrived. Uh, goodbye, Blake. And remember, Harold, the next time we meet, I want to hear all about your experiences in that house. What house is that? Nothing. Your accent, Mr. Richards, it's quite singular. Is it? Yes, rather difficult to place. I would venture to say you've traveled a good deal. Yes. I've not been in the habit of speaking English for some years now. Not since you were banished from the court of the Raja of Pradesh. I beg your pardon. I have seen a miniature of you, Mr. Richards in a house you once inhabited and perhaps even built in Hatch Lane. You passed by that house this morning. Look at me, Mr. Ronsford. No, you shall not attempt to hypnotize me. I have been a student of life and nature, and there are some questions I am determined to ask you. Hmm. I sense you're a highly intelligent man. That may prove important to me. Therefore, I concede you the privilege you seek. What would you ask? What is the ultimate power of the human will? What is the ultimate power of thought? Think, and in an instant you're in China. True, but my thought has no power in China. It may have. 
A simple thought may alter the whole condition of a country, may it not? What is a law but a thought? Thought does have power, Mr. Rumsford. But does it have the power to revive the thoughts of the dead? Or to survive death itself? I decline to answer. Then it is possible that intense evil in an intense will, aided by certain scientific means, may produce extraordinary effects. Is it possible, for example, that it can haunt a house by raising all the guilty thoughts and guilty deeds ever conceived or done within those walls. And is it possible that if this will were disciplined and focused enough, it could invest these thoughts with the power to kill if the will of the person under attack did not resist with more strength than the will of the attacker? You are not without glimpses of a mighty secret. Glimpses? You are only close to the truth. Why do you refuse to answer my question about the power of thought to survive death? Why do you think, Mr. Romsford? I shall give you a hint. The brain may have such potential, but in the instance which you have just described, it is not necessary. Then, then it is true. It is possible. A person having trained his willpower to such a degree may turn that power on himself? Precisely and will to live on. From time to time he appears to die. He transfers himself and his wealth to another part of the world and doesn't return until those that would remember him are dead. Is this true, Mr. Richards? Is this true, Lord Shillingford? Jack Tarbuck? Mr. Cavendish? Mr. DeRocca? You have an extraordinary perception, Mr. Romsford. An extraordinary mind. But even though you can slow the advance of age down to an imperceptible crawl, you cannot arrest it altogether. I can see lines in your face that were not there in your portraits. You will die, Mr. Richards, for even a will as powerful as yours cannot conjure immortality. I have sought one like you for the past 100 years. What? It is too late. You have looked at me. You cannot, you cannot avert your eyes. Look, Mr. Rumsford, look. Now that I have found you, we will not part till I know what I desire. The vision that sees through the veil of the future is in you at this hour, never before and never to come again. Soar and look forth. You are right. I have mastered great secrets by the power of the will. But I must know, can I escape death by accident? No. Oh. Every accident is providence. Shall I then die by an accident? Or ages hence by the slow, inevitable growth of time? You shall die by accident. But is not the end still remote? Regarded by normal standards, it is still remote. And before it comes... Shall I use my powers to win the power that belongs to kings? You will yet play a part that will fill the earth with commotion and dread. You will have power such as no man has ever had before. But not forever? Not forever. How and what is my end? Look east, west, north and south. In the north, there the specter of death will seize you. But that day is very far off. Yes. These are all the things I wish to know. Sleep now. Harold. Harold, wake up. Uh. Oh, oh, what happened? <laughs> I, I 
I never thought I'd see this. You have always declared yourself proof against mesmerism has succumbed at last to my friend Richard. Then. Richard? Where is he? He's gone. He left shortly after you passed into your trance, saying you would not wake up for an hour. I've been asleep an entire hour. To the minute. You're all right. <sighs> Where is Mr. Richard staying? I believe it's the Trafalgar Hotel. We must go there at once. <laughs> The clerk said he's gone. He returned 20 minutes ago, paid his bill and left. Is it really so urgent that you find him? It is absolutely imperative. He left instructions which steamship should receive his baggage. If we hurry, we can catch the next train to Southampton. Excuse me, are you the gentleman who was asking for Mr. Richards? Yes, I am. He said you might be coming by, so he asked me to deliver this note to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wished you to utter what was in your mind. You obeyed. I have therefore established power over you. For three months from this day, you can communicate to no one what has passed between us. Do you doubt my power to lay on you this command? Try to disobey me. At the end of the third month, the spell is raised. For the rest, I spare you. I shall visit your grave a year and a day after it has received you. Harold? Harold? Oh, what? What does the note say? Oh, it's nothing, really. Well, we've got to hurry if you still want to follow Richards to Southampton. I don't think so, Blake. No? But just a moment ago, you... Now, see here, Harold, what's this all about? Nothing, Blake. It's not really all that important, after all. Who can say when an extraordinary person will appear among us? Who knows what thoughts, what intentions, what powers lurk behind the placid countenances of those we pass on the street? When will one of them step out of line and declare himself a savior or an avenging angel or simply an evil egotist bent on acquiring for himself all the wealth and power he can until he is stopped? I shall return in a moment with a final word. The power of suggestion is a potent force indeed. Think, and in an instant, you are in 19th century London, the setting of our story. Think, and your mind can transport you anywhere we choose to take you, here on Mystery Theater. And that is why you will tune in seven nights a week. Do you hear me? Our cast included Gordon Heath, Robert Dryden, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, 